this first page is Friday is coming out of Freak the Mighty. This is by Rodman Philbrick. Sometimes Mrs. Garcia reads this with her glasses. It might be familiar to you. Chapter one, The Unvanquished Truth. I never had a brain until Freak came along and let me borrow his for a while. And that's the truth, the whole truth, the unvarnished truth is how Freak would say it. And for a long time, it was him who did the talking, except I had a way of saying things with my fists and my feet. Even before we became Freak the Mighty, slaying dragons and fools and walking high above the world. Called me Kicker for a time. This was daycare. The year Graham and Graham took me over and I had a thing about booting anyone who dared to touch me because they were always trying to throw a hug on me like it was medicine I needed. Graham and Graham, bless their pointed little heads, they're my mother's people, her parents. And they figured, whoa, better put this little critter with other little critters his own age. Maybe it will improve his temper. <laughs> yeah, right. Instead, what happened? I invented games like kickboxing and kick knees and kick faces and kick teachers and kick the other little daycare critters. Because I knew what a rotten lie that hug stuff was. Oh, I knew. And that's when I got my first look at Freak, that year of the phony hugs. It didn't look so different back then. We were all of us pretty small, right? But he wasn't in the playroom with us every day. Just now and then he'd show up, looking sort of fierce is how I remember him. Except later, it was Freak himself who taught me that remembering is a great invention of the mind. And if you try hard enough, you can remember anything, whether it really happened or not. So maybe he wasn't really all that fierce in daycare. Except I'm pretty sure he did hit a kid with his crutch once. Whacked the little brat pretty good. And for some reason, little kicker never got around to kicking little freak. Maybe it was those crutches that kept me from lashing out at him. Man, those crutches were cool. I wanted a pair for myself. And when little freak showed up one day with these shiny braces strapped to his crooked legs, metal tubes right up to his hips, but those were even more cool than crutches. I'm Robot Man, little freak would go, making these weird robot noises as he humped himself around the playground. Er, er, er. Like he had robot motors inside his legs, going er, er, er. And this look like, don't mess with me, man. Maybe I got a laser cannon hidden inside these leg braces. Smoke a hole right through you. No question, Freak was hooked on robots even back then. This little guy, two feet tall, and he already knew what he wanted. Then for a long time, I never saw Freak anymore. One day, he just never came back to daycare. And the next thing I remember, I'm in like the third grade or something, and I catch a glimpse of this yellow-haired kid scowl at me from, scowling at me from one of those cripple fans. Man, they were death ray eyes. And I think, hey... That's him, the robot boy. And I was like, whoa, because I'd forgotten all about him. JK was a blank place in my head, and nobody had called me Kicker for a long time. Mad Max, they were calling me, or Max Factor, or this one butthead in LD called me Maxi Pad, till I persuaded him otherwise. Graham and Grimm always called me Maxwell, though, which is supposed to be my real name. And sometimes I hated that worst of all. Maxwell. Oh. Grandma out in the kitchen one night after supper whispering to Graham, had she noticed how much Maxwell was getting to look like him? Which is the way he had always talked about my father, who had married his dear departed daughter and produced <coughs> Maxwell. Grimm never says my father's name, just him. His name is too scary to say. It's more than just the way Maxwell resembles him, Grimm says that night at the kitchen. The boy is like him. We better watch out. You never know what he might do while we're sleeping, like his father did. And Graham right away shushes him and says, Don't ever say that, because little pictures have big ears, which makes me run to the mirror to see if my big ears is what made me look like him. What a butthead, huh? Well, I was a butthead, because like I said, I never had a brain until Freak moved down the street. The summer before eighth grade, right? That's the summer I grew so fast, Grim said, We'd best let the boy go barefoot. He is exploding out of his shoes. That barefoot summer when I fell down a lot and the weirdo robot boy with his white yellow hair and his weird fierce eyes moved into the duplex down the block with his beautiful brown haired mom, the fair Guinevere. 
Only a falling down goon would think that was her real name, right? Like I said, are you paying attention here? Because you might even, you, because you don't even know yet how we got to be freaking mighty, which was pretty cool, even if I do say so myself. Chapter two, up from the down under. That summer, let's see, I'm still living in the basement, my own private down under in the little room Grim built for me there. Glued up this cheap paneling, right? It sort of buckles away from the concrete cellar walls, a regular ripple effect. But do I complain about the crummy paneling or the rug that smells like a low tide? I do not, because I like it in the down under, got the place all to myself, and no fear of Graham sticking her head in the doorway and saying, Maxwell, dear, what are you doing? Not that I ever do much of anything. Grim has it fixed in his head that I'm at a dangerous age and they need to keep me under observation, like I might make bombs or start a fire or whack out the local pets with my trusty slingshot or whatever, except that I never had a slingshot. It was Grimm who had one when he was my age. The proof is right there in the family photo album. You can see this blurry little miniature Grimm with no front teeth, grinning at the camera and yanking back on this prehistoric slingshot. Good for whacking mastodons, probably. Just proper targets, Grimm says, closing up the photo album. End of discussion. Like, whoops, better hide the evidence. Don't want to give the dangerous boy any ideas. Not that I have any ideas my brain is vacant okay i'm just this critter hiding out in the basement drooling on my comic books or whatever all right i never actually drool you get the picture anyhow this is the first day of july already counting down for the fourth and wondering where can i get and i'm wondering where can i get an m80 which is supposed to have the explosive power of a quarter stick of dynamite or something and when it goes off, your heart thuds to a stop for a microsecond. Wham! Which is probably what Grimm is afraid of. <laughs> Max armed, Maxwell armed with dynamite. So I finally get bored in the down under, and I'm hanging out in the so-called backyard, your basic chunk of chain link heaven. Grimm keeps this crummy little mower in the shed, but what's the point of mowing dirt, right? Okay, I'm out there messing around, and that's when I see the moving van. Not your mainstream, nationwide brand name mover either, just some cheapo local outfit. These big bearded dudes in their sweaty undershirts lugging stuff into the duplex half that's been vacant since last Christmas when the dope fiend who lived there finally got busted. At first I'm thinking, the dope fiend is back. He's out of jail or whatever and he's moving his stuff back in. Then I see the fair Gwen. Not that I knew her name, that was a little while later. At first she's a glimpse. Connor going between the van and the front door, talking to the beards. I'm thinking, hey, I know her. And then I'm thinking, no way, butthead. No way you know the female that beautiful. She looks like some kind of movie star. Wearing these old jeans and a baggy t-shirt. And her long hair is tied back and she's probably sweating. But she still looks like a movie star. She has this glow, a secret spotlight that follows her around and makes her eyes light up. And I'm thinking, well, this improves the old neighborhood. You're thinking, yeah, right. The goon is barely out of seventh grade. Who does he think he is? All I'm saying is the fair Gwen had star quality. And even a total moron can see it. And the reason she looked familiar is... I must have seen her bringing Freak to daycare way back in the dark ages because the next thing I notice is this crippled up yellow haired midget kid strutting around the sidewalk giving orders to the beards. He's going, hey you, doofus, yeah, you with the hairy face, take it easy with that box. That box contains a computer. You know what a computer is? I can't believe it. By then, I'm sneaking along the street to see what's going on, and there's this weird-looking little dude. He's got a normal-sized head, but the rest of him is shorter than a yardstick and kind of twisted in a way that means he can't stand up straight and it makes his chest puff out, and he's waving his crutches around and yelling up at the movers. Hey, Gwen, one of the beards says. Can't you give this kid a pill or something? He's driving us nuts. So Gwen comes out of the house and pushes the hair out of her big brown eyes, and she goes, Kevin, play out in the backyard, okay? But my computer! Your computer is fine. Leave the men alone. They'll be done soon, and then we can have lunch. 
By this time, I'm hungering along in front of the place, trying to maintain a casual attitude. Except, like I said, my feet are going wild that year, and I keep tripping over everything. Cracks in the sidewalk. Ants in the sidewalk. Shadows. Anything. And the strange little dude jerks himself around and he catches sight of me and he lifts the crutch and points up at my heart and goes, Identify yourself, earthling. I'm busy keeping my feet from tripping and I don't get it that he means me. I said identify yourself, earthling, or suffer the consequences. I'm like, what? And before I can decide whether or not to tell him my name or which name, because by now I recognize him as the weird little robot kid from daycare and maybe he remembers me as Kicker. Anyhow, before I can say a word, he pulls the trigger on that crunch and makes a weapon noise and then goes, Die, Earthling! Die! I motor out of there without saying a word, because I'm pretty sure he really means it. The way he points that crutch is only part of it. You have to see the look in his eye. Man, that little dude really hates me. He wants me to die.